Welcome to our live broadcast from the Mountain of God Tabernacle, high atop Mon Eagle Mountain, Tennessee. My name is Apostle Terry Dunn, and I'd like to tell you that we are a five-fold full gospel interdenominational church which offers contemporary praise and worship, the teaching of God's Word, healing, deliverance, prophetic ministry, and much more. We are located in beautiful downtown Mount Eagle, Tennessee at 331 King Street. That's at the corner of King and Fourth. Our Sunday morning worship service starts at 11.30 a.m. Central Standard Time, and everyone is welcome. Now, if for some reason you cannot attend our sanctuary, be sure to join our live stream at wildfireonthemountain.com. That physical address again is 331 King Street, or you can watch us live at www.wildfireonthemountain.com. Now I want to say good morning, and my name is Apostle Terry Dunn, for those who may not know me, especially those who may be watching us by internet or on a DVD at a later time, I want to welcome you. Now if you have your Bibles with you, turn to Luke chapter 12, and while you're turning there, I want to tell you that unlike a lot of other preachers, and especially certain denominations, I only preach a salvation message when the Holy Spirit leads me to do it. And this is one of those times. There are certain preachers that that's all they pretty much teach. But that's not my case as an apostle, because many times everyone we have in the congregation is already saved. But the Holy Spirit has led me to teach a salvation message. This, these, this is one of those times. And the title of my text this morning is, Jesus is not an option unless you want to go to hell. So you can already see this isn't going to be your typical salvation message. Now some preachers may think that, you know, my title's a little harsh because I use the word hell in it, especially those who are politically correct. But according to Scripture, it's one of the ways Jesus himself spoke when he talked about the subject of salvation. So reading in Luke chapter 12, let's look at verse, let's see, 4. And this is Jesus speaking. He says, And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body and after that have no more that they can do. Now, the them he's referring to would be like man. Don't be afraid of man. He can only kill you. Or Satan. Or his, the demonic realm. He says, but I will forewarn you. Now, that means this is a warning. A warning ahead of time. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. And then look at the next word. I'm reading in King James. Fear is capitalized. That means like he's shouting it. Fear him, which after he has killed, you mean God kills? Yeah, he does. Fear him, which after he has killed, has power to cast into hell. Then he says, yea, I say unto you, and he screams it again, fear him. And of course, the hymn is God. Now, one of the reasons this verse gets skipped a lot by a lot of preachers who preach salvation messages rather than it be used to give them, a, say, a hellfire and damnation message, the reason they skip it is that certain translations, I have to be honest with you, have watered it down from being a warning to being just a suggestion. They say things like, and I'll quote three different translations, it says, I will suggest to you, not forewarn, I will show you, or one of them says, I will make clear to you, whereas the King James Version, which I'll give credit to, even though I'm not by any means a King James only preacher, 
But the King James Version says it like this in Matthew 10, 28, which is the synoptic verse of what we just read. It says, fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, for those people, both Christians and non-Christians alike, those people who choose not to believe that hell exists, and I've heard it many times, turn to Matthew chapter 25 and i show you that it does exist, and that if you continue to believe otherwise, you're calling the one and only person who can keep you from going to hell a liar. See, many uh, in Christendom today are calling Jesus a liar by not believing every word he ever said. Matthew 25. Uh, verse 31. And again, this is Jesus speaking. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on the right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was a hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, were in prison and came unto me. And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his Angels. Now just think about that. You're standing there, and if your judgment is you're getting ready to be cast into everlasting fire, that's a pretty awesome time. For I was hungered, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment put the righteous into eternal life. So according to Jesus' own words, there exists a place that contains everlasting fire and everlasting punishment for those who do not obey his word. Everlasting means forever, never ending. The Bible mentions this place more than 50 times as being the place Jesus referred to as hell. And numerous other times it's mentioned as Sheol, Hades, the abyss, and the pit. They're all one and the same place, but they have different levels, as we'll see as we read on. Now, if for some reason you don't want to believe what Jesus said about hell, possibly because you, maybe you're a Messianic or you're a Jew that believes only in the Torah, then turn in the Old Testament to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 32, and we'll see what Moses had to say about it. Deuteronomy 32, that's in the Torah. Verse 22, Deuteronomy 32, 
22. Now this is God speaking. He says, for a fire is kindled in mine anger. What that means is God in his anger against sin has started a fire, kindle it, and it's to eradicate sin. He says, for a fire is kindled in my anger and shall burn unto the, what? Lowest hell. So if there's a lowest hell, there has to be a higher hell, a highest hell even. It says, and shall burn unto the lowest hell and shall consume the earth. Notice it says, consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. What Moses is saying here is that the same fire that's in hell will be used to consume the earth. Did you get that? And it will be used to consume the earth when the Lord re returns to purify the earth with fire. The Apostle Peter said it like this, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Hiroshima and Nagasaki during World War II will be an example of what he's talking about. Now, it's believed by many theologians and Bible scholars that this fire that Peter is talking about is the same type of atomic fire that God used to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And they've had scientists investigate the areas where Sodom and Gomorrah once was, and they find it to be uh, the sands to be melted and everything as if an atomic bomb went off. So it's the same atomic fire uh, used to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, which gives us the reason why God will have to bring down the new Jerusalem that's spoken of in Revelation chapter 21. Now let me explain what I'm talking about. The new Jerusalem that God will bring down from heaven, it's in the book of Revelations, that new Jerusalem will be a radiation-proof city where all the saints will be able to live in safety until the rest of the earth is restored and rebuilt. Did you get that? That's why when you study what New Jerusalem is like, it's like a giant pyramid. And, and uh, they say millions of people can live in it and live on it the way it's structured. And you'll have to read it on your own time to get it. Now, this explains why it will take a thousand years to rebuild the earth during Christ's millennial reign. I mean, you ever thought about it? He's God. Why is it going to take him a thousand years? In other words, the earth as we know it today will have been destroyed by an atomic blast, which will take a thousand years at least to once again be made habitable for human beings. Now, I said all that to say this. The fire that's in hell is the same fire that's caused by an atomic chain reaction. The only difference is that because the sinner's body is still in the grave and only his spirit is alive, he can't officially die. And that's because he's actually already dead in one sense. However, because the fire is in the spirit realm, which is where hell is, and his spirit is a spirit being, he will be affected by it and be tormented by it for all eternity. Now, after me telling you this, I think it would be a good time to reiterate the title of my message. Jesus is not an option unless you want to go to hell, period. So according to what we just read in Deuteronomy 32, 22, hell is not only a real place, but it has several different levels. Psalm 86, 13 says, 
For great is thy mercy toward me. This would be David speaking. And thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. If there's a lowest hell, there has to be a highest hell. So in light of all that we've read so far, to not believe in hell means you don't believe the Bible. And if you don't believe the Bible, then there's a good chance you'll end up going to hell. Because you've rejected God's word, and according to John 1.1, 1, 1, Jesus is the word. Therefore, whether you know it or not, you've rejected the only one who can keep you from going to hell. And that's Jesus himself. You can see the seriousness of this. There's going to be many people going to hell, and they don't even know why they're going to hell. They've just been taught the lie through certain uh, false doctrines and so forth. And they're going to find out they're going to be in the judgment, just like we read back, I think, in Luke chapter 12. And he's going to say, depart from me into everlasting fire and everlasting punishment. Now, what I just said applies to both Christians and sinners alike who reject Jesus as their Lord and Savior, as well as the Jews who reject him as their Messiah by not keeping the Torah. And let me explain what I mean about keeping the Torah. John 1, 1, and in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the Word is Jesus in print. The first five books of the Bible is the Word. It's called the Torah. Now, we've been taught the lie. Oh, nobody can keep the Torah. You know, the laws. Daniel did it. The, uh, the little la uh, old lady in the church, I forget her name, did, saw Jesus as a baby before she died. She kept the Torah. Many people kept the Torah. What a lie. Now, there's many of us that can't keep the Torah. You know, because it says if you break one of the laws, you've broken them all. So there are people in this book that kept the Torah. They're Jews. And if they kept the Torah, they kept Jesus and Jesus' teachings. Therefore, they are saved. So this lie we heard that all Jews are going to go to hell because they didn't accept Jesus as their Messiah is just what I said, a lie. Because if they keep the Torah, and I have a friend who's a Jew, and they keep the Torah. I mean, the, the foods they eat are kosher and everything else. So if you keep the Torah, you're keeping Jesus. So the lie that because they didn't accept Jesus as their Messiah, they're going to hell, is just that. It's a lie because they are accepting Jesus, whether they know it or not. They're accepting Jesus by keeping the Torah, and they're waiting for their Messiah to come, and guess who he's going to be? Jesus. You see how much we've been lied to? You've got to study this thing, and you've got to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal the truth, because we've just been overwhelmed with lies and deceptions and junk in the church, doctrines of man and traditions and all this stuff that has nothing to do with what the Bible really says. In short, I can say it like this. The church in general does not understand the king or his kingdom. And that's sad. Because many of those people, and you'll see as we read on, are going to be those people where he says, part from me, you cursed. Because you didn't do this and that and that, and you didn't keep my word, and you just thought you were saved. Now, I'm not the judge when it comes to judging people. Only God is that. But that's pretty much what the Bible as a whole says. Therefore, the most important question now that one should ask themselves is, do I believe the Bible or not? And if you don't believe the Bible, then there's a good chance you will end up in hell and eventually be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, as spoken of in the book of Revelation, because I showed you that if you don't believe the Bible, you're calling Jesus a liar, especially the things he personally said. You think, uh, I mean, liars don't get into the kingdom. That's in there as well. Now turn to Isaiah chapter 5, 
And I'll show you something else about this place called hell. We don't hear a lot of hellfire and damnation messages anymore. You know why? Because it hits people with the truth. And it hits them in their spirit. And it convicts them. And they feel uncomfortable. They don't know why. So they just leave the church and don't come back. And the uh, church leaders are saying, wow, we're losing parishioners. Look at all the empty seats. What do you think God's going to say about that? God doesn't count full seats. He counts the people, and he judges them by their heart and by the Spirit. And if you don't tell them the truth, I mean, where, I mean, where else are they going to go? There's only one hell, and that's where they'll go. Isaiah 5, let's see, look at verse 13. Therefore, my people, who's that? Believers, Christians, his people. Therefore, my people are gone into captivity. Now, you're going to find out as we read on, he's talking spiritual captivity. Now, you might get regular captivity in a, in a certain application, but the application the Holy Spirit showed me is he's talking spiritual bondage. Therefore, my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. Another word for knowledge is truth. Jesus is the way and the truth. It says, and their honorable men, that would be their pastors, priests, church leaders, and so forth. And their honorable men are famished. Famished means they're spiritually starving. And a lot of them don't even know it. And their multitude, who's that? That's the congregation. And their multitude dried up with thirst. It's a thirst for more, and they don't know where to get it. Because they were raised in a certain denomination to say, oh, you got to stay here for the rest of your life because your mother, were, father stayed, was here, and your grandparents were here. You know, they have a thirst for more, but for some reason they can't get out of the bondage that's holding them in these dead, dry, false doctrine churches. Then it says, uh, oh, oh, a thirst. It says, therefore. Now, Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So that goes right along with this scripture. But look at verse 14. Therefore. That word therefore means that everything I just read about in the previous verse is going to cause what we're going to read about. Because of all this, therefore, hell has enlarged itself and opened her mouth without measure, and their glory, that's the glory of their church, the glory of their processions down the aisle, the glory of how they do the Eucharist, and yet they're not doing the things that God has called them to do. It says their glory and their multitude, that's their congregation. See, if you're sitting under a, a, a pastor or a priest or something that's not teaching you the truth, God's going to hold you accountable for that as well. It says their multitude, that's the congregation, and their pomp, that's pride and, you know, this big theatrical thing, and, and we look like we're really pious and we're this fancy church. Meanwhile, they're not healing the sick, cleansing the lepers, raising the dead, casting out devils, or even preaching the kingdom. They're just doing church at a big, glamorous, in a big, glamorous way, pomp. It says, and he that rejoiced, rejoiced this shall descend into it. That means going to hell. In other words, those who rejoice in the pride and arrogance of these particular uh, denominations or structures or, or religious organizations who don't want to hear the truth will descend into hell. Now, in essence, what this is saying is that hell is growing larger by the minute in order to make room for all those who don't want to hear the truth. And what I know about the churches of today, that's a lot of people. It can be as many as a thousand people in one congregation. Because God is serious about this. And they haven't been told how serious he is about this because they don't want to take the chance of losing them. Because when you go to a pastor's meeting, and I've been to maybe two of them, I'll probably never go to another one again. First thing they ask you is, how big is your church? 
And they don't ask you how powerful your church is, or are you moving in the gifts, or are you carrying Jesus' ministry, or are you doing what he wants you to do? They say, how big's your church? And I thought, wow. Because, see, their church is maybe hundreds and thousands, and they're bragging about it. That's pride. That's pomp. That's their glory. Now turn in the New Testament to Luke chapter 16. And while you're turning there, I want to give you a few facts about hell. Other than it really exists. Been there, done that. I'll talk about that in a moment. Number one is that it is a place of fire. We read that. Number two is that the fire was kindled by God for the purpose of punishing those who reject Christ as their Lord and Savior. And number three is that the grave is not, and I repeat, the grave is not hell, nor has it ever been as some doctrinal preachers have falsely taught. taught. And that's because nowhere in the Bible does it say that there's fire in the grave. I mean, I've heard preachers teach that. Oh, it's in the grave, that's just hell. No, it isn't. It's the grave. Therefore, hell and the grave are two separate entities. The grave is where the sinner's body is held until the time of his judgment when both his spirit, which immediately, immediately went to hell at the time of his death, and his resurrected body will be reunited and then cast into the lake of fire and brimstone forever. The great white throne judgment. Whereas the believer whose spirit is absent from the body and present with the Lord, as referenced in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, will be reunited with his body, which has been in the grave since the time of his death, and then given a glorified body during the time of the resurrection so that he can spend eternity with God. Now, the difference between the two is that the believer spends time in heaven waiting for the resurrection to take place, while the sinner spends time in hell waiting for the resurrection to take place. And after the resurrection does take place, the believer goes on into eternity with Christ, their king, while the sinner spends his eternity in the lake of fire and brimstone with Satan and the fallen angels, as referenced in Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. Excuse me. And this is what it says. And the devil that deceived them. Did you get that? The devil that deceived them. The devil that deceived who? All these people we just read about that are into this pomp and this glory and all this pride and all this stuff, but they're not serving the king. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And you can even continue and ever and ever and ever and ever. It's not finite. Now, contrary to the doctrine of soul sleep, which means you fall asleep and you just stay in the grave, and that's about it until maybe the resurrection. You know that you don't go to be with the Lord if you're a believer. But contrary to that doctrine, the doctrine of soul sleep, the sinner in the grave doesn't just lie there in some form of uh, suspended animation, uh, animation, I guess they call it, which is taught by some preachers. But instead, like the believer who's absent from the body and present with the Lord... He's also absent, the sinner, from his body, but he's present in hell. The parable we're about to read proves it. Let's look at Luke chapter 16. Look at verse 19. This is Jesus speaking. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. That means he had all the luxuries he needed, which is why it's harder for a rich man to get into heaven. 
And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So the dogs came probably and got the crumbs. While they're there, they're licking his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. That's nice to read. Because when you die, you're going to be escorted uh, by the angels into the presence of the king, Christ. It says, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, and the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. Notice, it's plural. Torments. There's not just one torment. There's torments. And that's probably because there's different levels of hell, and each level will have different torments. It says, And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger <coughs> in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy life receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Think about that. What he's saying, if you're going to be all about yourself in this life, then you ain't going to make it into the kingdom. But those who are the have-nots are struggling just to make it. If they know God, they're going to make it in the kingdom. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. That means it's permanent, forever. You can't cross it. So that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would... Uh, would send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. That's how important the Scriptures are. Forget what your pastors say, your priests say. That should be secondary to what this says. Then he said, and he said, no, father, or nay, father Abraham, <clears throat> but if one would, uh, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. That's what he's saying. And he said unto him, this is Abraham, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. So according to this, even if someone comes back from the dead and tells people about hell, most likely they won't believe them. At least not enough to change their way of life. Now let me give you one of the reasons why they won't believe them. There's probably a lot of other reasons. Hell contains so much torment that there's nothing on this planet the person can compare it to. So it doesn't scare them much. So what they do is they end up dismissing it or explaining it away. I'm referring to what the person tells them about hell. Now, I know this for a fact because I had a near-death experience. And I didn't go through the bright light like some of these go. I went through the dark tunnel and I went to hell for three minutes earth time. And I told you, uh, in the eternal realm, there's no time. Heaven and hell does not have time. God created time and he put us in it. And you've only got so much time to do what he's purposed you to do. So do it. But in hell, there's no time. So three minutes earth time was eternity. When I say eternity, the, the very second I entered into hell, I knew I was there forever. I knew it. And I felt it. Now, some people have asked me, well, did you go to where the, the flames and the fire and brimstone? Yeah, I said, no. At the time, I didn't know there was different levels. No, I was on a level that you might have called the pit or the abyss. It was just dark. <clears throat> it was so dark that the demons that were there were darker than the darkness uh, that you can get when you're in a, a, a cave and you turn out the lights. And we've been in caves. You sang in one, remember? And when they turn out the lights, it's so dark, you can put your hand right here and you can't see it. 
The only reason you know your hand's in front of you is it touches your nose. Yet the demons were darkened to that, and you could see them. That's why they're called the kingdom of darkness. Like, duh. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm talking about myself, see? Because I had to understand these things when I came back from hell. Three minutes earth time, which was eternity down there. Now, I was not in this lake of fire and brimstone, if it's already created, and it may be down there. I didn't see it. I was in this dark place, and so people didn't take that as, well, that ain't no big deal, you know. Yes, it was a big deal, because it's the only time in my life there was no God in me, around me. See, we're creating His image. There's a certain amount of God in all of us. When you go to hell, it's not there. It's withdrawn from you. And that feeling of God not being with you, and believe me, I wasn't a Christian. I wasn't walking a Christian life. It's so tormenting in itself that you just want to die. Yet you cannot die. Now, the Holy Spirit revealed this to me. That's the same feeling that Jesus had on the cross when he said, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? Pay attention. You've been told by certain people that, well, that's just God turning his away from Jesus because he couldn't stand the punishment he's taking. I'm not so sure that's totally untrue. But that's not why he said it. He said it because all of Jesus' God part was removed. And he felt the same thing I felt. Only he felt the pain of the nails in his hands and his feet. See, he, had to, he died for us. Man. So he had to be man only to die for us. He couldn't die with any part of him that's God. He died for us. So he had to die as a man. And that's what he did. And he experienced that. And he says, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? The Father had to take the godliness, part of Jesus, out of him so that he would die as a man for man. That's really awesome. For me especially, because I felt that. And I cannot even express to you what it feels like unless you've been there and done that. No matter what I try, I can't explain it. Because there's nowhere on this planet that you can receive that same feeling. Because God is with you even if you're a sinner. Because you're created in His image. So after three minutes, earth time, I went to hell when I was in the ambulance and the doctors brought me back in the emergency room. It took me about six months to get over it. And I'd tell people, try to tell people about it and the torment was so, uh, so bad, I guess. It, I just start weeping and crying. And six months later, I maybe could talk a little bit about it. It took me about two years to get over it. But most people I talked to didn't, they didn't believe me. They said things like, you need to see a psychiatrist. Well, I did. I went and seen a psychiatrist. Psychiatrist happened to be a spirit-filled psychiatrist. So she believed everything I told her I experienced. And that was God that put me in her presence instead of some quack psychiatrist. And it took me about two years to get over it. And I still tell people about it. And they don't want to believe it. In fact, we were at a picnic. Remember that picnic a few years back? We had picnic tables out, and this person comes over who was part of the, the birthday group, Uncle Buck. And he knew we, I was a preacher, and, he's, he, says, and uh, he comes over and says something, and he says, well, I'm going to heaven because I pay my bills, and I'm a good person. And I said, wait a minute. <laughs> Paying your bills and being a good person ain't going to get you into heaven, according to this, you know. 
He just says, how do you know? Oh, he says, uh, he didn't even believe in heaven or hell. He said, because anybody uh, has gone to hell, they ain't come back. And, you know, so how do I know there's a hell? Because I told him that's where he'd probably go. And I said, wait a minute. <laughs> and I told him. I'd been there, and I told him as much as I could about it in the best way I could in a short period of time. He didn't listen. He still probably thinks he's a good man and pays his bills, so he's going on into heaven. I don't know where he got that nonsense, but he didn't get it in this church. That's for sure. Now, for a closing scripture, turn to Matthew chapter 18. And I'll show you how serious Jesus is about us not going to hell. See, a lot of preachers read this stuff, and they read it like they're reading a <clears throat> Reader's Digest or something, or, you know, their local trade paper, or, <clears throat> or the newspaper, or something that doesn't have any depth to it. And that's because most of them are not Spirit-filled, therefore the Holy Spirit can't reveal to them the depth of what is being said in God's Word. So it gets watered down, and it gets where these verses are just something that sounds poetic, or something that's in there, or maybe even if they're a little more schooled in the Bible, something that Jesus himself said, or Paul, or Peter, or one of the apostles. But they don't understand it, because they don't understand kingdom. Everything in here is about the King, Jesus, Yeshua, the Christ, and Messiah, and his kingdom. Everything. Matthew 18. Look at verse 8. Jesus speaking. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut it off and cast them from thee. Now, think about the pain of cutting off your hand or your foot, and it doesn't compare to the pain and torment you will experience if you go to hell. That's what he's saying. He's not telling you, oh, go cut your hand off and your foot. He's using just an analogy. But what he's saying is, is that this is so painful if you did that, and I'm telling you, this doesn't compare at all to the pain you will experience if you descend into the pits of hell for all eternity. Then it says, it is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed, that means crippled, or uh, maimed, uh, rather than having two hands and two feet to be cast into what? Everlasting fire. This isn't fire where you get burned once, oh, and you wrap it up, and you know, when I was a kid, they told them put butter on it, and then they told them don't put butter on it. I don't know what you do. You just spray something on it that the doctor gives you, and if it's burned bad, or <clears throat> go to a burn ward. But it's only temporary. This is not. This is everlasting. That means forever fire. Verse 9, and if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into what? Hell. Fire. So that's how much torment awaits those who reject Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And I can't even tell you how much torment that is. I only know what I experienced. But I can't tell you what the torment is in this lake of fire or hell fire and this everlasting fire. But he's trying to tell you that. And you need to get it in your spirit. You need to stop this nonsense of doing the world things and start doing the kingdom's thing. Stop it. Or you may find out that you'll be one of those that he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. Or he's going to say, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting punishment. And then it's too late. See, when I was in hell, one of the things I was thinking is, wow, I blew it. I really blew it, and there's nothing I can do to change it. I knew I was there forever. Of course, I wasn't because it was all God's plan to change my life. It took a near-death experience and going to hell to change my life. That's how big a sinner I was. I wish he'd do that to everybody. But he doesn't. He's God and he does whatever he wants to do. But I knew I was there and I blew it. And I didn't have to blow it. If I'd have just done what I was told to do, 
the problem I had, I was told to do it by a certain denomination that, I don't know, I don't want to speak against them. They do get a lot of people saved, I guess, I hope. So I didn't understand the depth of it. They never preached on hellfire and damnation. You're going to go to hell. Oh, they preached on John 3.16, and once you've gone through the prayer, everything's fine. Well, when I was 12 years old, I <laughs> went through the prayer, and I memorized John 3.16 for the purpose of being able to go to camp. So you could go to, all right, you go to Baptist camp <laughs> if you memorize the verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And I went to camp. So I m memorized that verse so I can go to camp. It had nothing to do with I need to know that verse and apply it to my life or I'm going to go to hell. That never crossed my mind because nobody ever preached it. And that's sad. Because Jesus speaks hell many, many times. Now, in closing, let me say one more thing, or say it again. Jesus is not an option unless you want to go to hell, and unless you want to be thrown in the everlasting fire and hell fire forever, he is not an option. Don't make him an option. I did it, and I ended up in hell. I don't regret the fact that I learned something about that. But while I was there, I regretted everything I did and did not do. Close your Bibles. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. For your word contains the truth about our eternal salvation. It contains the truth about our eternal destination. And Father God, we hereby ask that in these last days you would awaken your beloved church to the fact that salvation is what you say it is in your word and not what the enemy has claimed it to be through his lies and deceptions which have caused and is still causing the mouth of hell to enlarge. For your word says, wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be which go in thereat. Lord, we pray for the many. And we ask it all in the name of Yeshua, Jesus, the Christ, and Messiah. And everyone in agreement said, Amen. And if anyone here does not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, just see me afterwards, and I'll explain to you what you got to do to not go into the pits of hell. Thank you for joining our live broadcast here from the Mount of God Tabernacle. We hope to see you soon, and may you have a blessed day in the Lord Jesus Christ.